Okay, so the first trend, okay, so before we get into this, as always, please don't forget to comment, like, share, subscribe, check out the Patreon, the Instagram, support, and everything it means a lot. It really does, guys. Definitely appreciate the support. You guys already show the channel, and let's keep it growing. Okay, let's talk about these five trends that I think should end for EDC primarily. Now, the first one for me is one that kind of seems paradoxical if you know the channel because you know that I have a lot of titanium frame locks, but I think the first one up on the list is that we should not see any more titanium frame locks. Now, in fairness, I think there are some exceptions to this. I really do like my Hinder XM18, especially this purple one, and I do like my Chris Reeves, my Striders, and kind of the original high-end knives that were titanium frame locks. I am a little bit more partial to them, but it seems like in current kind of EDC knife life that uh, the go-to for companies like Civivi with the Elementum and so many other knives out there is just with Civivi, with Wii, and so many of these other companies, even things like, or even companies like uh, Spyderco, you know, they just all kind of revert to, if you want a high-end knife, if you want titanium, it's going to be a frame lock instantly. And there are so many other different locking mechanisms out there, especially considering, while I'm not directly encouraging people rip off uh, Benchmade's Axis Lock, the patent for the Axis the axis lock is now done and so companies like SOG are taking advantage of that and kind of pioneering their own ideas and renditions of the axis lock and so I really wish that we could see high-end knives whether they're flippers or not flippers that are just not titanium frame locks. I feel like the high-end knife industry is so saturated with titanium frame locks and so whether you want a Hinder or a Strider, or Chris Reeve, a Medford, um, just you name it, Shiro, Grismo, um, just any of the major high-end knife companies, you have to go with a titanium frame lock. Whether it be a flipper titanium frame lock or like I said, a non-flipper, you know, it just feels like high-end folders are automatically titanium frame locks. And I just really hate to see that because like I said, there are so many other different types of awesome locks out there, even from companies like Spyderco with the compression lock. And I know that Spyderco does a pretty good job with integrating their uh, compression lock into knives like the Sham and of course the Para series, Para Military 1, or sorry, Para Military 2, Para Military 3, and Para 3. Uh, are all predominantly or all feature the compression lock. So I do understand that there are other locks and companies out there making titanium blades uh, or titanium handled knives that are not frame locks. But, you know, you go into knives, for instance, just because I have it handy here, uh, things like zero tolerance, for instance, zero tolerance is absolutely riddled with a crippling amount of titanium frame locks, whether it's this zero uh, tolerance ZT04562 or you know their 452 I believe it is or you know any number of their knives basically all of them are either steel or titanium frame lock blades and while don't get me wrong I really do like the carbon fiber and I really do like this blade shape and design because it is a hinderer designed collab but once again you know kind of it just feels um this point a bit exhausting seeing that like anytime you want a high-end blade or high performance blade it automatically is a titanium frame lock so i really think that, that is something that the edc community should kind of move on from is the titanium frame lock as a whole Okay, next one is gonna be a little, probably a little bit contentious. I'm really not actually sure, but I watch a lot of EDC guys on my, or I watch a lot of EDC guys or EDC videos. And one thing that I see, and granted it's not everyone, is a lack of firearm, is a lack of firearm content. Now, if you guys know, you know I love to carry my handguns. You know that I have quite a few. I have five pretty much designated everyday carry handguns. Most of them chambered in nine mil, like my Glock 19. This is currently what I'm actually carrying. But, you know, ultimately, um, I really wish that more everyday carry content or content creators would feature firearms. There are a few people, don't get me wrong, like Talon Say or Talon Sai, that does a really good job. He's even came up with collaborations uh, of his own types of Glocks and different CCW handguns. So Talon is doing a great job. 
but I feel like most, like the overwhelming majority, probably like 85 to 90% of EDC content creators and producers uh, just do not feature handguns at all. And that's actually, in my opinion, a little bit shocking because I do realize that, you know, there are quite a few EDC content creators uh, in different countries where firearms aren't really allowed or are more heavily regulated, but the vast majority of EDC content creators are based here in America. People like Best Damn EDC are definitely based here in America or in the US and they certainly could and I think should feature firearms and uh, yeah and I know a lot of people I have got some kickback and I've talked to people in the EDC community about hey why don't you feature firearms and a lot of it comes down to you know regulation they don't want their videos you know dinged or uh, they don't want their videos hit, dinged, or demonetized for featuring firearm content. But the thing is with YouTube, uh, you know, it's kind of twofold. If we just bend down and don't, you know, I'm not saying like necessarily lash back, but if we just bend down and just surrender to them and we just give up our firearms or don't feature firearm content, the firearm community as a whole suffers from that. And so for me, even if I'm not, you know, even if my videos do get demonetized, which luckily there are, you know, certain firearm, um, rules when you go to post videos that you know allow most firearms to be featured in content and monetized but even if that's not the case you know the gun community has existed far before youtube far before the edc community far before many communities and i think firearms are absolutely pivotal and crucial to you know longevity and uh, just in general you know promotion of this in society is important because there are a lot of content creators out there that are very anti-gun. So really, we have to be here, whether you're EDC or firearm content creators, we really have to be there championing safe, responsible, smart gun ownership and featuring them in videos, talking about them and normalizing firearms as much as possible. That's my opinion on it. Of course, everyone varies, but I really do think that the EDC community would benefit from just more prevalence of firearms, even if that comes with shadow banning, even if that comes from demonetization or with demonetization. Um, really, like I said, the community is far more important than any money that you could be making off of it. And I think by just bending down and trying to placate for money's sake, you're actually really doing yourself and the community as a whole a really big disservice. So I would love to see more firearms integrated. Of course, you guys know on this YouTube channel, I'm no stranger to firearms. And while not every video Videos about firearms I certainly am unapologetic and will talk about them however I need to whatever I need to and for whatever reason I need to so definitely I'm gonna keep producing firearm content I just wish more people on the YouTubes would as well especially as it relates to everyday carry because there are so many different activities from being athletic and you know running playing basketball stuff like that to you know more casual desk life or different you know occupations that might that firearms might, different firearms might work better in. So I would love to see more of that. Okay, last one up, or not last one, next one up is going to be what I consider pocket trash. Now I don't really have anything here that really fits the bill for like pocket trash, so I'm just gonna fiddle with a knife. But what I mean by this is you'll see, especially a lot in the Instagram or maybe more photogenic or photocentric people uh, that there's this rise or preeminence of just carrying useless stuff, things like coins or different things that you can fidget with, or people even carry things like little screwdrivers and just random things with them uh, that are just completely unrelated to the tasks that they do on a daily basis. And I think this rise of pocket trash is kind of uh, not very beneficial to the EDC community as a whole because one, a lot of this pocket trash is very expensive and granted some of it, like the coins are made of like titanium, so I get there is some like legitimate value, like titanium is an expensive metal, so it does require it to be expensive, but a lot of it's more uh, based on an idea or an ideology of trying to flex on people or really just, even if it's not as targeted as like me trying to say I'm better than you, it's more an ideology of look at how much money I have because I was able to afford a $500 coin or you know look at how much money I have. I was able to afford whatever completely useless piece of equipment uh, that's also very expensive. Now, once again, this is one of those kind of paradoxical things 
things because I do realize that, you know, I carry a lot of very expensive knives, you know, especially, you know, these kinds of knives are, you know, ranging in the three to five, six hundred dollar range. And of course I have even more expensive knives than that. But, uh, you know, with knives, it's never really about, at least for me, you know, kind of showing off my wealth. It's just that I really appreciate a high quality, well-built, well-machined piece of equipment that serves a utilitarian practical function. So I just really like the materials, the build, the fit, the finish, the mechanics or the mechanism of the piece of tool. And this tool also directly serves a utilitarian function for me. So if I wanna cut open a box or something, this tool of course will perform just about as good as a $1 knife, but for me, I like to admire its build quality and how it's made, the mechanics behind it. So, you know, from a practical standpoint, if you have a really expensive knife, I feel like, you know, it's a little bit more justifiable than, you know, a titanium coin that serves absolutely no purpose other than a status symbol. I mean, that's purely what it is or what it's intended to be. And so from that reason, I think the rise of pocket trash, which is what people in the community legitimately call it, I'm not trying to demean it, uh, it's literally called pocket trash and it serves legitimately no function. <laughs> so I would love to see that trend die out too. Okay, the next one up on the list is also yet another thing that I'm gonna be more talking about rather than demonstrating because I really don't subscribe to this ideology either, but it's kind of what I consider lack of function and or why China is beating us. And what I mean by that is you've seen probably in the last handful of years, probably about last three to four, maybe even five years, that the rise of things like Wii knives, Riate, Civivi, um, and so many more, I think like QSP as well, just this load of upper end or higher quality Chinese knives have absolutely been dominating the market. And part of the reason why is price point. But the other part of the reason I feel is that as far as American knife manufacturers and manufacturing has been going, it's been pushing more and more into this lack of functionality and more just exotic designs, wild steels, wild, you know, types of aesthetics ultimately. You know, I mean, there's many different ways you can make things like titanium so I'm not necessarily saying that the materials are always wild themselves but you see, see the rise of things like damascus steel and you know wildly anodized things and of course different blade shapes that are completely impractical and some people may argue you know that this recurve on this uh, hinder xm18 is not terribly practical especially for an edc knife but when i'm talking about wildly impractical i'm talking about things like the stovepipe from spider co um, i'm talking about things that are just completely out there and if you do like those blade shapes or styles or you know that type of uh, you know look it is an interesting look but it absolutely serves no function and that's the primary reason why most EDC people especially people who are on more of a budget end up going for things like Civivi or we or Riate because Riate and we especially have prices that honestly are in the same range as many ZT blades but you'll see ZT blades by and large um, not all of them of course not that uh, this ZT in particular but a lot of them or maybe not a lot of them but a good portion of them do have more wild and more outlandish blade shape styles and so even for similar price points you just see blades that lack function and uh, you just see a lot of the market pushing to china for one once again you know price and two ultimately like the lack of function and just wild designs that companies like spider co and benchmade and a lot of these mainstream knife companies that are made in the u.s or notoriously usa made blades uh, are going in that direction so that is another thing that i would love to see stop i mean it really you know like going back to benchmade for instance um I have a Benchmade, you know, 556 mini grip here. And I mean, this is just pure function. And the fact of the matter is Benchmade isn't even making this knife anymore or not in any high volume. And so, you know, they're really walking away from such classic practical blades. I mean, you know, a lot of people hype up and I keep mentioning it here, but the Civivi Elementum is a wildly popular knife in the EDC community, partly for its price and partly for its design. And I mean, honestly, the Benchmade 556 uh, mini grip is about 
about the same size as a Civivi Elementum, and it has, you know, honestly about the same quality of steel, even in the 154 CM. And I mean, really, this was its predecessor. But you see companies like Benchmade just walking away from that design, the price point, the materials of that blade that made it such a classic staple for everyday carry, and going into more wild, outlandish things like the uh, Benchmade tagged out I think it is and things like the bug out that are just really not as practical and honestly not as desired by your everyday common people I mean don't get me wrong I mean don't get me wrong here the bug out and I do have one I've had more in the past you know they do serve a specific function in my EDC but if I was going for just a general do-all blade I would much rather have the 5d6 and knowing from my personal experience, you know, I have friends, I've recommended blades and stuff. I've sold far more 5D6 mini grips or 5D5 mini grips than I ever have any bug outs. And that's because most of the time when my friends go to grab, you know, a mini grip versus a bug out, they know that the bug out really doesn't fit their hand that well. Whereas the mini grip, even though it's technically a smaller grip size, it has more thickness to it and thus it feels more hand filling. And so, you know, when you have companies like Benchmade, you know, USA made companies just walking away from that, you really lose a lot of that market share to ch more Chinese made companies. So anyways, I would love to see a return to practicality and function first, as opposed to weird, you know, acute objectives like having the world's lightest folder or you know, having some wild blade shape for hunting that's not even very practical. <clears throat> okay, this last one is gonna be a little bit more of a knife forum kind of thing. And depending on how, how interested or how involved people are in the direct knife forums, we're talking Facebook groups, you know, direct blade forums and stuff, uh, this may or may not apply to them. But I've really noticed, especially in the past, you know, three to four years, uh, it is a very large rise in predominance of just knife flippers slash salesmen in these knife groups. And don't get me wrong, I'm not opposed to people selling their EDC knives in, you know, forums to other knife guys. I think that's great. And that's, you know, how I've gotten a lot of my knives. But ultimately, I really dislike seeing just straight up knife salesmen, where what I mean by this is they will collect aggregate amounts of knives, and then go on these knife forums and just post a lot of knives, just a string of knives. It's not someone actively, you know, selling off their collection, or it's not someone, you know, selling a couple knives because they got them and they either didn't have enough money to keep them, or they didn't like the design or something like that. And these are purely people out here trying to make a profit on the knife community. And for me, that's never really sat that well because it goes hand in hand with knife flipping. Now, knife flipping, on the other hand, is definitely a bit more of a moral gray area in the knife community. And knife flipping works like any other flipping. If you guys are familiar with shoes, you'd be probably pretty familiar with flipping, especially things like Nikes, uh, because Nike, you know, Air Jordans of many different numbers or generations are very collectible. So therefore people will buy them at their factory MSRP price of around $200 and sell them upwards of four, five, even upwards of $1,000. So not saying that it's quite that bad yet with knives, but especially we saw with things like the Boker, um, I believe it was Blade HQ, but Boker collaboration with the Dessert Warrior. Um, there was just a huge, <clears throat> there was a huge flood in the market of people who bought this knife, the Dessert Warrior for around $40 and were selling it for upwards of $100. Another one that was a really good recent example, at least recent to the time of this video was, um, uh, Andrew Demko or AD, the knife company, uh, or Demko, I believe they're called, made a knife. I'm trying to remember, I believe it's the 8020 or it's the 20.5, something like that. It was designed to be Demko's or Demko Knives kind of budget knife. And so they marketed that knife, they sold it, and it sold out super quick. It was about a hundred dollar knife. And immediately, you know, next day you saw knife flippers on the forums trying to flip that knife for, you know, upwards of $150. And so once again, you know, it really defeats the purpose of knife consumers or, you know, knife manufacturers, I should say, trying to offer, you know, reasonable budget, fun, collectible blades uh, to the knife community and them getting absolutely pirated by flippers. Another kind of ancillary way that we're seeing this too is with multi-tools. I know Leatherman has made their garage series and the garage series is plagued by flippers. Um, people are buying things like the Mr. Crunch and many of the other different releases from Leatherman's garage series. 
and selling them for 10 times what they paid. I mean, I think the original, like Mr. Crunch, the Mr. Crunch, I think originally went for about $200 from Leatherman, could be wrong, maybe it was closer to 500, but somewhere around that range and they are going for into the thousands, you know, three upwards of $3,000 and it is absolutely ridiculous. It is insane in my opinion. So I really, really do not like the flippers. And once again, the flippers, as far as EDC is going, uh, as far as the EDC communities are going, they're getting a bit more cracked down because they are, you know, just absolutely trying to price gouge fellow knife collectors. And uh, that's not appreciated, but even seeing just straight up knife salesmen, people who are trying to flip knives for a buck is not appreciated either. All right, guys. So it was a little bit long-winded in some of those areas, but hopefully you enjoyed talk or hopefully you enjoyed this talk about some of the trends in EDC that I think should end. These ones are ones that I'm pretty passionate about, as you could probably tell. And once again, there are definitely some, not everything is quite perfect in the EDC community, but I just wanted to talk about a few video or a few different topics that really I feel quite strongly about and things that I really think should be brought to an end. So. Anyways, guys, hopefully you enjoyed the video. Hopefully you enjoyed, uh, if nothing else, learning about the EDC community and some of the things that, uh, some of the trends that are out there right now. And uh, as always, guys, God bless and I'm out.